Hi, I'm Reish Mihara. Today, I'm going to talk about King Solomon's dilemma and my solution to it. Let me give you an outline first. First, I describe the problem both informally and fairly formally. Second, I'll give you my solution to it and also an idea of how it will work. Finally, I compare my solution with another simple solution in the literature of mechanism design. I hope this talk will give you a flavor of mechanism design, though I skip most of its jargons of that Nobel Prize winning theory. Now, please enjoy my talk. King Solomon's dilemma comes from the Old Testament. There are two women each claiming to be the mother of the baby on the left. The king wanted to determine the true mother of the child. So he suggested dividing the baby into two. One of the women then said, Stop it, I'd rather give up the baby. Stupidly, the other women didn't say that. So it was easy for the king to decide the true mother. Not much of a dilemma. Let's make it a little bit more abstract now. There are agent 1 and agent 2, as well as an object. Agent 1 claims the object. Agent 2 does the same. Well, never mind the kitten. The kitten doesn't look like their child. It's an object. If agent 1 values the object more, then she should get it. How do we do it? Let me formulate the problem more generally. There are n agents named 1 through n along with k and the physical objects, so it loses its value when divided. At stage 0, God announces v and h, where v consists of v1, v2, and so on. Here, vi is agent i's valuation of the object. That's the maximum amount that she's willing to pay for it. h is the set of the k agents with a highest valuations. So agent I belongs to H if her valuation is among the top K. We want to allocate the object to the top K agents. Here's what they know. The planner doesn't know the valuations or who are among the top K. Otherwise his problem becomes trivial. On the other hand, everybody knows that there's a gap of at least delta between the valuations of the top K agents and the rest. If i is in h and j isn't, then their valuations are at least delta different. Each agent i knows her own valuation as well as whether she is among the top k. So she doesn't know the other agent's valuations or who other than herself is among the top k. Let's try to solve the problem. How about an auction? Take the k plus first price auction for example. For k equals 1, it's the second price auction. In this auction, if agent i is among the top k bidders, then she gets the object, but only pays the k plus first bid. A nice thing about this auction is that it's always the best for each agent to bid her true valuation. Why? Here's an argument for the second price auction. Suppose you are willing to pay up to $100 for a good. Case 1, if the highest bid other than yours is greater than 100, say 109, then you lose a value equal to $9 if you get the good. So you'd better not get it. That's insured as long as you bid $100. Case 2, well, maybe you do it. Unfortunately, auctions are not good for our purpose. We want to avoid transferring money between agents. But we can use the K plus first price auction for constructing solutions. For example, Old Zelski uses a sort of a second price auction, except that he modifies the payment by adding the stuffs in the parentheses, the other agent's bid minus delta. So even the agent that doesn't get the object receives some money. Sounds strange? I'll come back to his mechanism later. My mechanism is just the K plus first price auction with entry fees in which participation is voluntary. So in stage 1, each agent says whether she claims the object. 
In other words, whether she is participating in the auction or not. If the number of agents participating is less than or equal to the number of the objects available, then the objects go to the agents that claim it. Otherwise, those claiming the object pay an entry fee of delta and participate in the auction. That's it. Okay, here's how it will work. From the property of the K plus first price auction, we know that each agent bids her valuation in stage 2. This is because taking the entry fees doesn't change their incentives. Next, look at an agent I in the top K. We can show that she claims the object in stage 1. Well, stop the slide and read it. The numbers there show her payoff, assuming that she claims it. Finally, look at an agent J not in the top K. Since she can expect that the top K agents are participating, she knows that if she participates, she needs to pay the entry fee without getting the object. I focus on Olszewski's mechanism here, since it is one of the simplest in the literature. Also, I deal with the classical case of two agents and one object here. Olszewski's is a two-stage mechanism, whose stage two is the modified auction stated earlier. Like the second price auction, each agent bids their valuation. In stage one, each agent says either hers or mine. If both say hers, an auction will be held and the payoffs are there, assuming that agent one has the highest valuation. If only one says hers, then the agent who says mine gets the object. If both say mine, then they get nothing. You can see that it is always best for agent one to say mine while all it's best for agent 2 to say hers, so the baby goes to agent 1. Let's consider the possibility that agents could bribe each other to coordinate their strategies. Suppose that V1 is 100, V2 is 50, and the gap delta is 20. The equilibrium of the game in the previous page gives payoffs of 100 and 0. Now, if agent 2 gives agent 1 a bribe T when both participate in the auction, then payoffs are modified as in the table. So by setting the bribe T equal to 1000 and agent 1's bid B1 equal to 2000, agent 1 receives 100 minus 20 plus 1000, that's 1080, while agent 2 receives 2000 minus 20 minus 1000. That's 980. Much better payoffs for both of them. The example above shows that Olszewski's mechanism is vulnerable to collusion between agents that bribe each other. On the other hand, we can show that my mechanism isn't vulnerable to such collusion. Well, that's the end of this talk. See you 